Hello and welcome to Skipped History. I'm joined today by Natalia Melman Petrozella, a historian of contemporary American politics and culture at the New School. Professor Petrozella is co-producer and host of the acclaimed podcast, Welcome to Your Fantasy, and the co-host of Past Present Podcast, big fan, like I said. She's a frequent media guest expert, public speaker, and contributor to outlets including the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and the Atlantic. Professor Petrozella is also the author of Classroom Wars, Language, Sex, and the Making of Modern Political Culture, and Fit Nation, The Gains and Pains of America's Exercise Obsession, which is the subject of our conversation today. Professor Petrozella, I am so excited to be speaking with you today. Big fitness fan, even if from a limited capacity at the moment. So thank you so much for your time, your scholarship, and for being here. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. Of course, my my pleasure. I, I should say, if we ever, if I ever have the privilege of recording an interview with you in person, I promise you, I will show up in a full sweat gear, uh, everything from head to toe. But in this case, we'll keep it casual. <laughs> and to begin, let's go back in time. Your sure. book traces really, you know often evolving perceptions or rapidly evolving perceptions of fitness, although haltingly uh, evolving perceptions of fitness in the U.S. over time. It's an unequal history in a lot of ways, which syncs with a lot of the history we explore. And I'm interested, going back to the 1890s, how were the first models of strength in the U.S. treated as sideshows? And also, how was whiteness an integral part of fitness from the get-go? Another point that, that you elaborate on. Right. So it was really hard to decide um, when to start this story because hmm. obviously we've like moved um, for as long <laughs> sure. as we've been humans, right? Sure. And actually, there are a lot of um, kind of histories of exercise which take that really long view and they look at almost like an evolutionary mm -hmm. biolog biological perspective. But I'm like, no, I want to tell the story of kind of what exercise means in modern America. And I found that a really useful place to start was at the World's Fair in 18. 1993, where we had this display of strength that I think really highlights like what working out and particularly strength training meant and didn't mean at that time. So um, I think it's really important to realize that there were these strong men and a few strong women who attracted a lot of attention in this time period in the early 20th century. And mm -hmm. they would get on stage and they would flex and they would like bend iron bars and do these crazy things where like barnyard livestock would walk over their chests. This woman and Katie Sanduina would lift up her husband and these other guys over her yeah. head and yeah. they would do all these things. And the first thing to realize is like, these were like freak shows. Like people would line up to watch them and they would right. not have that feeling of like, oh, I should have gone to the gym today. They'd be like, look at these weirdos, you know? Like these people were, you know, on par and often displayed really along with like the bearded lady or the so-called Siamese twins. And so I think that's the first thing to realize that it was really weird to exercise yeah. in that way. And then yeah. when you ask about whiteness in particular, one of the things that's so important of how this um, culture and activity went from being this like weird subculture to being normalized and even seen as virtuous was all about connecting it to a kind of white superiority. And so mm. one of the things that I found, which was just so wild and maybe it shouldn't be surprising, but I was surprised at how explicit it was, was mm -hmm. that a lot of these like early boosters of strength training and general health and nutrition and fitness were giving advice of the sort that we think is normal today. Like eat vegetables, lift weights, go outside and get your heart rate up. They didn't talk about heart rate, but effectively that. Mm -hmm. And the way that they framed the urgency of this uh, advice was this is important to strengthen the white race because right. we're in the moment where all of these so-called inferior races are coming over as immigrants. There are, you know, newly emancipated former slaves and they're reproducing at this really fast rate. And if we white people want to keep our racial superiority, we've got to get physically strong. And this was intensified by the fact that um, a lot of white people in this period were working in like desk jobs. And so they were doing this right. cerebral work with, which kind of proved their superiority 
maternity, but it also had this impact on their body. And so they had to deliberately exercise. So you see that all over these, um, the writings and the kind of like promotional materials of these right. early strength trainers and also how they were received. Like in the newspapers, it's like, oh, the beautiful Bavarian stock of her muscles. Like, you know, it's really wrapped up in that in a way that is very, very explicit. And I was surprised at how like point blank it was. Yeah, as was I, although like you're saying, with the t with the uh, second thought of, okay, maybe not that surprising given lots of the history that is coming to light these days, thanks to scholars like yourself. And it's in, you talk about the great Sandwina, I thinking about her hoisting her husband and her children <laughs> around on stage. And there also, there's, it, I was struck too that there, at the same time that she was doing this, there were newspaper, like her husband would give interviews saying, make, making it clear that she was still committed to domestic activity, right? Oh yeah, totally. So this woman, Katie Sandwina, was like totally breaking barriers. Like she was this huge jacked woman who was like up there tossing her husband around. And yeah. a lo this is the moment, of course, when the suffrage movement for women is like really gaining speed. And so there yeah. were all of these kind of progressive feminist journalists who are like investing her with like all of this symbolism, like, oh, like may the world be full of Sandwinas, then we would have the right to vote and we wouldn't be the weaker sex and blah, blah, blah. And then, um, you know, one evocative example is one of these journalists goes to interview her and her husband and they're at home and she's like craving some like awesome feminist, like girl power soundbite. And the and Sandwina's like practically silent. The husband's doing all the talking and he's like, she loves laundry. She loves cooking. And, he, and, she, and she's like, yeah, I think American women are lazy and kind of like crazy. Um, and so she's just not giving that. I do think it's important that a little later on by like about 1912 or so, she does actually become active in like the circus women's suffrage movement. <laughs> but um, yeah. I think that the husband and her in many ways had to like reassure the public of her femininity. This is a quote unquote normal woman. She loves her husband. She loves doing laundry because the spectacle of a strong woman was just so um, out of the ordinary. And you know, that was so, I like actually I remember going through with my editor and he's like, I feel like you're repeating yourself a little later on because that motif literally comes up again and again in yeah. the 40s, in the 50s, in among CrossFitters today even, right. you know? And so, um, but I think it's a really, really powerful motif. These w strong women who break barriers with their bodies and their abilities often have to engage in this like public reassurance project of like, no, 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 I'm a real girl, you know? Yeah, it, it does come up over and over again in, in the, the intersection of fitness with, with racism, with, with sexism, with homophobia. This motif, it's part of when reading your book, one of my takeaways is just like, oh my God. If things evolve, but things really evolve to a very limited extent over and over again. Um, let's, speaking of evolution, and also uh, I, we should say just to circle the story that the great Sandwina, just when she finished giving that interview, she snapped her husband in half and he sadly died at the time. <laughs> but uh, moving to after World War II and into the early stages of the Cold War, can you talk a bit about how fitness mentalities evolved to an extent, both under Ike and but much more so under JFK? Yeah, so there's this big transformation that happens in the 50s and 60s during the Cold War, and it's really sparked not necessarily by these presidents, but by this woman who, Bonnie Pruden, who is a homemaker, although she'd been a dancer on Broadway, and she was a real mm -hmm. outdoors woman, and she looked around her bedroom community in like White Plains, New York in the yeah. late 1940s, and she's like, okay, we're the people who are supposed to have it all, but you know what we don't have? kids who are in good shape, like mm. all of this affluence, these cars, TVs, like pre-made kind of frozen food, like all of that is actually having this huge bodily toll on our kids. And mm. so she gets together with this doctor and they develop this test called the Krauss Weber test and they test children and they realize like American kids compared to Europe are like not in very good shape and no one listens to them. Like when they're worried about children's health, people are like, 
ah, not that interesting. They published that first study in some obscure journal, a journal so obscure, it's almost impossible to find today. I like kind of found it, but um, it's cited a lot. Um, <laughs> okay. and, and, and yeah, it's just like one of those source things. Like I talked to other scholars yeah. of this, and they're like, yeah, here's like a photo <laughs> of the page, but we can't right. really get the full thing. Mythical. But anyway, so no one was listening until she very cannily got people to see it as a national security risk. And mm. so then she, they first catch the attention of Dwight Eisenhower, who's president, you know, former general with the assistance of some professional athletes. And they basically are saying that this fitness is a liability in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's Eisenhower who creates this first presidential council on youth fitness, which is all about getting kids, boys really, fit to fight. Mm -hmm. And that like starts that project of kind of like reimagining regular exercise and fitness, not as this like weird, subversive, narcissistic waste of time, but right. as actually civic duty. Duty. And right. so that he really starts that. But under Eisenhower, like it's pretty militaristic and grim. Like this is like <laughs> making soldiers, you know? And then Kennedy really expands it. First, he drops the youth from the Presidential Council on Youth Fitness. So even though he expands youth programs, he's like, everybody should be exercising. And he's like, you know, sponsoring all this community recreation stuff. And he's showing off with his family. They're like working out on the beach and kind right. of trying to show that this is absolutely a national security issue. And he has this like very fat shaming article he writes in Sports Illustrated called The Soft American. But he's also like, fitness is fun. Fitness is part of the lifestyle of people like the Kennedys, right? And so I think that that really is massive, not so much in investing in infrastructure to actually like allow a lot of people to work out, but mm -hmm. in terms of like framing exercise as civic, as uh, like civic virtue, but also as like something for the affluent, like, you know, leisure, you might use your leisure time to exercise and you should, if you're like a good disciplined American. It's so interesting to me. And so antithetical to how I think that at the time you talk about how, when Pruden and her peers were pushing physical activity, you say they're pushing in a moment when most Americans were still overwhelmingly suspicious of the virtues of exercise, yeah. which is so like, people really thought it was a bad Thing to totally. Exercise. Yes. And that, sorry, I'm like cutting you off, but I feel no, like we please, need to pause please, on that. Please. Um, no, I think that that's so important. So one of the things that I'm like really trying to convey in this book is like today we have this remarkable consensus among people who disagree ab about basically everything else right, that right. exercise is good for you. Like, I don't care <laughs> if you're like a Trump supporter or like Bernie, like Occupy Wall Street, whatever. Like most people think exercise is good for you, right? Yeah. yeah. That was not the case at all. Like actually even in the 1950s um, and in other, even in the 1980s, honestly, there were doctors who were like, if you do anything more than walk briskly, your heart is going to explode. Like right. you're going to be in the ER. If you're a woman, your uterus is going to fall out. You're not going to be able to have babies. <laughs> so there was this real sense that exercise is not only kind of vain and narcissistic, but it actually could be a health risk. Crazy. And I, there, I guess we'll see more examples of, of, uh, some of that, I guess, I, I can't, I just have to pause too on a moment where you, you discuss the, the time when JFK is talking about the benefit, he's espousing the benefits of this 50 mile hike that people that the military or that the Marines uh, go on in their training and then, yeah. and then RFK goes on the 50 mile hike in his loafers. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, and he's, he defends it because he's saying, you know, my brother challenged me to do it to you know, walk through the snow in loafers, but it helps explain why every picture of him le from the, for the re remainder of his life, he was seen wearing a nice, so comfortable pair of Merrells. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so we're talking about how these people really are suspicious of exercise. JFK, Eisenhower, with Pruden, Pruden kind of changes things a little bit. Eisenhower then takes a cue from her and JFK furthers it. Can you talk a bit about how early brick and mortar gyms and TV programs then transformed exercise from something associated with 
and frivolous body modification into part of san- you know, seeking sanity and joy in everyday life. Yeah, and a place to spend your money too, right? Oh, oh right. Uh, <laughs> and spend your time. <laughs> right, so yeah, so this book and like I hope I did it gracefully, but it was really challenging to kind of like weave together like this policy story and yeah. a, a story of like the rise of an industry, really. But I really do right. think they're connected and connected as narratives in part because of how far apart they were in many ways in terms mm-hmm. of like their cooperation or their contact with one another. Mm-hmm. But it's absolutely true, like as you say that. So, you know, I think that Eisenhower and Kennedy kind of get things going with like um, sort of cleaning up the image of exercise. But then in many ways, it's a private industry that really runs with mm-hmm. um, diffusing or disseminating that message. And that looks uh, that takes a few different forms. You mentioned two of them, which I think are really important to look at. One is television. So um, in 1951, a guy named Jack LaLanne um, starts this TV program that he can't even get funding for because no one thinks that somebody would watch a exercise television show and they yeah. certainly don't think that anybody would like set aside what they're doing to exercise along with the person on TV. So <laughs> right. Jack Jack LaLanne had come out of Muscle Beach. He was a bodybuilder and a an, uh, kind of athlete. He had owned a gym in Oakland like in 1936 when he had to get a blacksmith to make equipment because nobody made gym equipment in that era. Mm-hmm. So he starts this show and it's interesting. He's not doing any of the exercises he does like on the beach lifting heavy weights or acrobatics it's very gentle but he's basically introducing this idea to his audience who are primarily homemakers of like you to be a happy full person you need to move and i'm going to show you how to move in a way that will increase your physical health you know stop aging make you happy and he has it's really funny it's a time before anyone used like anatomical descriptions in any kind of casual way so like he would never say your abdominals he'll be like we're gonna work on the front porch ladies like <laughs> right. you know Set and so back porch. yeah yeah totally and it's really pretty gentle stuff like light leg lifts and whatever but that's kind of what america needed for this like right. soft entry into exercise right. and i think also i mean <laughs> i watched hundreds of these episodes but you you know, he's like this really jacked guy. He has to dress in this very modest way. He wears these almost like like coveralls kind of that kind of yeah. show that he's muscular, but like don't show too much. Yeah. Um, so that, that like, show like pottery yeah. barn it. Pottery barn fitness, more or less. Yeah, Point. kind of. Yeah. Well, was, that's funny you say that because he was always using furniture. Like he's like, just grab <laughs> yeah. a chair, you know? And I think yeah. that is so important because it was on for like 30 years. That really got exercise into people's lives. One of the things that I think is so important about it is in many ways it was great. Like it kind of mainstream the idea that exercise can and you should take time for yourself to do that right and he's always talking about taking time for you on the other hand it's so clear that there's a flip side to it and there's also this sense that like oh do you feel tired are you getting fat do you look old Mm -hmm. well that's your fault because you're probably not exercising and so it becomes this other list of this other thing on your list of chores for women of like to like properly occupy this life as like a suburban lady, I also now need to do my Jack LaLanne gymnastics, as they were called. Um, right. There's a quote. So yeah, that's one piece. Yeah, there's, go ahead. There's a quote I'm just remembering too that was, I forget who said it, but it was that women wanted the feeling of being free where men actually wanted to, to be free one of the distinctions. Yeah, that came a little later. And that was sort of about some of the more countercultural approaches like to yoga and the way that some of that language of liberation, like, oh, be free, feel yourself could be like, give the impression of like, letting go of some of these, um, you know, uh, like, patriarchal beauty standards and all the rest. Right. But in many ways, like women were not so free because that could allow them to be maybe more sexually available mm-hmm. or to like have to work on their bodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, wait, you asked me about brick and mortar gyms. Do you want me to talk about that or am I being too long winded? <laughs> no, no, I, I would love it. I would love it. Please, Jim. Okay. Um, okay. So brick and mortar gym. So pretty, like a few, within a few years of Jack LaLanne showing that this was a concept that people could get behind. It's really another one of his muscle beach peers, a guy named Vic Tanny and his brother Armand who start these brick and mortar gyms that become really the first chain gyms in America. And it's interesting. Their mission was really to show people that like gyms are not these like 
dirty, like grubby barbell places for like big gruff dudes. These are actually these like luxurious, beautiful places where like leisured people would want to spend time and hang out, even women. And so these gyms, I had so much fun researching what they looked like. They were like, first of all, they were carpeted, which I think is disgusting, but that's like billed as being like so like desirable. Well, sometimes you just want to lie in your own sweat, you know? Yeah, it's so nasty. So anyway, so carpeted, chrome equipment, tropical fish tanks. Lelaine actually later had his own chain and they would have like classical statuary in them. Oh, like, wow. you know, and the whole, it's like laying on so thick, this idea that like, you know what rich people do in their, for, in their spare time? They go work out. And that's very different from the way it was seen before where like, workout people were like kind of like weird and suspicious and you know th these spaces were dirty and undesirable right i i clocked that in the lane's health spas he that at a scarsdale location he housed a 400 pound caged baby tiger to symbolize yes, quote totally. race, strength and speed which is that crazy yeah. and it also goes to show you there's a little bit of that sideshow sensibility that sticks around like there's right. this like weirdness of the gym as like an attraction you know um and there are the tanny brothers actually they talked about before they started this chain of tanny health clubs um which was very popular it was like profile in life magazine before they did they had opened a gym they thought was like great in the 1930s in rochester and someone walked in and was like what do we do do we pay you to lift those things like they didn't even know I, you were I, supposed to go in and lift the weights yourself <laughs> that i also you when you're talking about the constraints within the beauty standards you mentioned the vibrating couches that were really popular mm -hmm. there so there's a bit of uh i just this is you know, this is kind of music to my ears but five million women owned vibrating couches at one point crazy I, crazy. crazy yeah go ahead i know i'm just like i don't is there something else going on with the vi like a vibrating couch in its, in its <laughs> own right like i mean there are many things that could be going on i'm just saying yeah i wouldn't a vibrating couch sounds very soothing to me so uh, i'd be so they were marketing to men as well so no shame and coveting the vibrating couch <laughs> okay um, so what's the deal with the vibrating couches? Uh, well, I think it's, 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 it's just, it, well, sure. What, you, if you mind just quickly, with, what is the deal? With yeah. Vibrating couches? So this was this thing called Stopper's Magic Couch. So Stopper had, was a doctor who had become popular selling weight loss plans. And then he goes into selling this big, big, big fitness device. I mean, fitness in air quotes device, which is literally a couch that yeah. would shake. And that was in line with the prevailing, uh, I don't even want to call it science, but like way of thinking at that time. Sure. Yeah. Of like kind of body work for women who were not supposed to do anything too rigorous. Like they were supposed to work on their body, but like you weren't supposed to like go for a five mile run or like lift heavy weights. Right. right. And so this, they like, was constantly being billed as like passive exercise. So you basically lie down and it like shakes your fat off. And so, and it <laughs> right. didn't, by right. the way, in, in case you're <laughs> right. in tempted to go out and buy one. Yeah, they yeah. have all these lawsuits against them. Right. But that case to me is really interesting, both because of, oh, why is oh, Siri like went on? I don't know why. Hold on. Ah, so, go away. Hold on. I don't know why that happened. That's so weird. Maybe I said something that sounded like it, but maybe sorry. She, she's in the market for a vibrating couch. Go on. Yeah, exactly. Apologies. But um, so basically, um, I think it shows a lot about these ideas about like, oh, women should only do passive exercise. Right. And also that you would like buy this extension of your living room to have at home. There was all this like marketing to husbands like, oh, you should buy this for your perfect, you know, holiday present. But I also think it's interesting because like it was a total scam. Right. And there was no regulatory framework around marketing fitness devices. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that I talk about it, there is a legal case against them. And I talk about some of these other kind of scam operations. Operations. And this is this constant like issue really in the fitness industry that we still see today, not so much in like a big established products like Peloton or, you know, the things you would buy mm -hmm. at home, mm -hmm. but really on social media where on the one hand, it's like this kind of wild west where people can just get 
share what they think they know or they come up with their devices or their diet plans or their workout plans. And like in some ways that's great because there's a low barrier to entry. And that's why we have such a kind of motley crew of interesting people mm -hmm. who are in this world. On the other hand, that totally makes it open season for scammers. And we still still see that today where it, um, you know, selling something as fitness or as wellness, like these are not really regulated terms. So there's a lot sure. of kind of shady stuff and hucksterism that happens there too. And I'm one, one piece of your book you know, related to this is that uh, different groups of people increasingly seek forms of fitness that are safe for them or that where they, they don't feel stigmatized. So you talk a lot about, we're talking about women now, but you also talk about the gay community finding some solace in, in some gyms as, as spaces mm -hmm. where they could, they could you know, be themselves more comfortably. I was also really interested in the rise of women's women's running, women's jogging, right around the mm -hmm. time that Title IX passes too. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and also the rise of dance studios that, that follow. Yeah, totally. So, okay, so Title IX is this landmark, you know, 1977, no, sorry, 1970s feminist watershed legislation that prohibits gender discrimination around um, programs like sports. And it applies mm -hmm. to other things too. Today we talk about it largely in terms of sexual assault, but also sports. But in that moment, sports were like a big flashpoint for mm -hmm. this. And this was a huge deal for feminists to accomplish because the idea that women should have access to athletics like flew in the face of so much right. thinking at the time that women should be passive, they shouldn't exercise, they're not athletic, it's not interesting to watch them, et cetera. And you know, some of those ideas are still around today. Of course. And so in the book, you know, there've been lots of great histories of Title IX that I rely on. So I tell a little bit of that story and how it represented the sensibility shift. But one of the things that I am and was most interested in writing this um, was in thinking about how did that Title IX sensibility, that sense of like, girls, women, you can and should move too. You are strong, you can do this. How did that filter in to the many more women who would never go out for like a varsity team or a college mm -hmm. team? Like, how did that shape their movement practices and their ideas? Mm -hmm. And so one is definitely in the world of women's jogging or women's running that you have some of the people who are actually active with Title IX who are runners. You know, they're both lobbying the Olympic Committee to like extend the, the distance that women can run and have women included in a variety of, of events. But this is also a moment when you have all of these road races for women, like just for women that are right. popping up all over the place. And those, as far as I know, have never been written about. Mm -hmm. And they are so freaking interesting because these yeah. are thousands of girls and women who are going out to run and they're doing this like, the, oh, this is this like weird activity. Like, let me try this out. I want to see, um, you know, if I could do this too. And I think it's both this like really honest and like important entry to athleticism, but it's also really a lens on like the way that a lot of this fitness stuff, especially for women is highly commodified. Like right. one of the biggest race series, series is series in this was the Bonnie Bell road races and mm. Bonnie Bell actually had been a company that had made um, like sunscreen and lip balm and stuff for the U S women's ski team. Mm -hmm. but then they pivoted. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I grew up with Bonnie Bell lip smackers, which were these like lip gloss, but they made kind of like more fun makeup and these Bonnie Bell races like paired um, a road race, like I think like a 5K usually with like, oh, come and get a free makeover at the counter in the right. department store. And so there was all of this kind of like traditional femininity that was integrated with this really new idea of like spending your Sunday morning going out running. And so that to me is really interesting in terms of the commodification yeah. and also that theme we talked about before of like, oh, I might be doing this weird thing of running a race, but don't worry, I'm going to go get my makeup done afterwards, right? Yeah, you have this very evocative photo in the book where I believe it's crazy legs, the a sh yeah. a shaving, there are all these women, young women who are in a race and they're all wearing t-shirts that say crazy legs right across the front, which it speaks to the commodification that you're talking about. And I have to mention too, the rise, the story you include about the creation of sports brawls. Yes, that, totally. Can you detail that for a moment, please? Because that was shocking to me. 
Yes. Oh, I love that a guy is into that story. So yeah, first like Crazy Legs, just for context, was a shaving cream brand. And so this, this that race was a, it was called the Mini 10K. It was originally, they had the idea, these New York City roadrunners, planners, like, oh, we should do a women's marathon. And then they're like, there are probably five women in New York State who could even run a marathon. So they decided to make it one loop of Central Park, 6.1 miles. They get this, this sponsor. They call it the Mini, not for Mini Marathon but because why else would women run except to look good in short skirts mm -hmm. and mini skirts mm -hmm. and i think one thing that's important there about the mixed legacy of this landmark race which is still around today um and some of the not so landmark ideas about gender at the time at the starting line as a publicity stunt they had playboy bunnies that were right. circulating with these like esteemed women's track and cross country athletes they were sponsored by a shaving cream brand and then also a lot of the men who are milling around are clearly kind of there to like watch <laughs> women in right. short shorts right so like all of that i think is part of it um okay wait then we were talking about what the, was we want to hear about the, next? Oh. the jog bra Oh, yes, the jog bra. So one of the things that is, I think, an interesting part of this story and also should make us pause when we think like, oh, all commodification is just evil capitalism and like they're just trying to sell us stuff and really we should be like working out naked or something like, you know, yeah. um, I think, yeah, there's a lot of like over commodification of fitness, but the sports bra story really shows how that's not the whole story. So basically these two women who are joggers and they're like always feeling really uncomfortable because their breasts are not properly supported when they're running. Sports bras do not exist. Conventional bras do not do the job. They also get sweaty and they just are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have stories in there of like Catherine Switzer, who's a famous runner who would like wrap herself in like ace bandages like nothing existed yeah. and so you could imagine like if you if you're already like encouraged by the culture not to go running and then you're like oh i have to like wrap myself in some like jerry rig like bandage to go running like this is mm -hmm. not something for me so these two women are talking about this and kind of as a joke one of their husbands like picks up two of his jock straps and he's like oh how about these and they're like Oh my God, what if we sewed two of those together? And first it was like the jock bra, right? And it, they, the first prototype really looks like that. It's like two jock straps yeah. sewn together. And then it evolves to the jog bra and then they eventually sell it. But it's amazing because it was so revolutionary and it was a really hard, it was both very needed, I think, but it was also kind of a hard sell. Like sporting goods stores were like, right. we don't like do boobs. Like what are, what are you doing here? <laughs> right. And then lingerie stores, which were mostly structured to like titillate men. were like, we don't want some like weird elastic thing here. Yeah. Like that's not what we do here. And so they really had to create like a new space for themselves themselves. Um, yeah. So it's a fascinating yeah. story. Yeah. Right. I, so surreal. I, I did not, when you were, when I was reading about the paragraph about the two women you know, who are making the sports bra, I did not expect the joke about, about jock straps to be the actual punchline about the sports bra being created, but it has made me look at anything that's kind of <laughs> stretchy in a whole new light. Like now yeah. when I look at like a large wedding tent, now I'm going to be like, was that originally just like 1400 jock straps together <laughs> like uh, the building block of society <laughs> that's right, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah um we're doing we're all i can tell how are you on are you okay on time right now yeah i have probably like i don't know what do you want like five ten more minutes i'm okay yeah let's go um yeah that's perfect i want to ask about the 80s um, yeah, of course. I'll, totally. I'll kind of ask you about the 80s, the 90s, then we can do a 2000s thing. Um, okay, cool. So in the 80s, speaking, uh, you know, by the 80s, you know, we have these images of like, you and you talked about this a bit, like Olivia Newton-John, where you know, people are, by then, kind of fitness, athleisure has become a bit more, um, much more popular. Can you talk a bit, can you talk about how VHS transformed fitness in the mid and late yeah. 80s, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, there's like some people over here and I'm just waiting for them to pass by, if that's okay. They're like okay. going up to our roof deck. It's okay. like a long thing. My husband is having a work thing. Do you mind? We can edit this out. I just want like waiting for them to pass so that it's not loud. Oh, that's totally fine. I can sing. Let's get physical. Okay, in we're the good meantime. now. Okay. okay, just cut that little bit out. Um, yeah, so much like television was a, a technological revolution that kind of spread fitness in the 1950s, VHS is 
absolutely the next chapter of that story in the 1980s. And if you think about like what it meant, basically like people no longer had to one, have a gym in their community that they could go to, which right. of which there were many more, but you didn't have to go outside of your house. You also didn't have to tune in at like 9.30 a.m. So like there's a reason that in the 80s we think of like that working woman who's exercising too. Like you could have this videotape and come home and do it whenever you wanted. Yeah. This is also the moment that we start hearing about like over exercise as an issue. Mm. And that I think has to do with VHS because you could just rewind and do it again and right. do it again. Right. And there wasn't really um, a check on like, oh, that class is over. I have to pay for another one. And so I think it's a really, really important um it's a really important uh, kind of chapter. And of course, Jane Fonda is the first person who releases right. the workout on video cassette. She is really resistant to do it. And when she first gets approached, she's like, I don't even know anyone who owns a, v a VCR. <laughs> and then in that decade, VCR ownership absolutely explodes. And fitness becomes one of the biggest categories, interestingly, along with porn. And the analysis of that is that fitness and porn are two things that like people will watch those videos again and again, whereas like a feature film, like, oh, maybe it's your favorite movie, but like, are you going to, is it enough to buy it rather than rent it, you know? And VHS tapes were really expensive at the time too. I think that's yeah. something to really realize also. And it's interesting that speaking of the couple directions I would go in, that, yeah, uh, I found it. There's a quote just talking about like how huge the VHS industry was. And just to illustrate it, you talked. You there's a quote from Arthur Jones, the founder of Nautilus, which is the manufacturer yeah. of of exercise equipment that was in facilities all over the country. And mm -hmm. he was so excited about the future of VHS, and he rightly so about its the, its potential to some extent. He said that he planned to quote cover every facet of education far beyond far beyond fitness from math to how to cook a pot roast or how to perform an appendectomy which one of my favorite quotes from your book love putting all those things together i totally agree that if you have free time when you're up in this preheating you might as well make use of the counter space and perform an <laughs> appendectomy also very interesting that jane fonda more or less created this whole how-to category um but what's, what's something that you get to here that's really interesting and on a, on a deeper level too, is that there's this shift to, or this increasing shift to individualism within the fitness marketplace that is part of this, the increasing commodification of it. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit uh, how that trajectory deepens in the nineties and into the early two thousands, like with, and how fitness increasingly comes to envelop people's lives while investment in, for instance, physical education dried up? Absolutely. And just like side note, I'm so happy that you glommed on to Arthur Jones because one of the few regrets I have about this book is not having included him sufficiently. Oh, like, wow. He's a whole story he on his own. He sounds like a character. Yeah. Yeah, he totally is. But um, thank you for giving him some spotlight <laughs> sure. there. Shout out, Arthur. Um, okay. So yeah, so one of the big stories that I'm telling here is basically how there was kind of this missed opportunity in the history of fitness in America that, mm. you know, fitness, like, its reputation improves and we have these kind of public sector boosters of fitness. But really what happens is we never really make good on that commitment to make a fit mm -hmm. nation and to have people be, have more access to exercise. And instead you have this like runaway industry, which has some great things about it, but is effectively a pay to play situation. Like if you can't right. afford it, like tough. And in some ways, a lot of fitness environments are actually selling some of that exclusivity. We're so excited expensive. We're for the skinniest. We're for the most ripped. Like there's something about like um, yeah. participation in some of those places, which is about exclusivity. And so in terms of kind of explaining how that deepens, I mean, you know, a lot of historians, nothing to do with exercise, have charted, I think, very compellingly the way that um, we've really seen since the 1970s, this like rise in austerity politics and this mm. cutting back of social and public programs and um, an increased sort of celebration of individualistic self-help ideology and of the private sector. And I think that the fitness industry is no exception to that. I mean, we didn't build that fitness, ed physical education infrastructure. If anything, we've only devalued PE. Um, in many different ways from right and left, quite honestly. Like we haven't really invested in building public pools and safe parks and having people have, you know, 
healthcare and access to healthy food that gives right. you energy to exercise and all that. Like all of that hasn't happened. And so instead we have as a culture agreed exercise is good for you, but in only kind of propping up a private industry to do so, we haven't really made good on our public commitment to the idea that this should be a right of citizenship or not even citizenship, but of, you know, participation in this society. I love your quote where you say, with each public program cut due to austerity, every basketball hoop moved in the name of public safety, every unexamined juxtaposition of unlit street and shuttered community, community center with expensive commercial gyms and connected fitness devices, we squander an opportunity to redress a widening fitness gap that divides and defines a policy that largely agrees on the value of exercise. And I really love to be reading your quotes to you because I'd much rather okay. you be reading them to me. But in the interest of time, uh, I, I guess one last thing I would ask you, you know, going yeah. on, you, you talk a bit about how there is this winding gap. You know, we, you know, from the, we've gone, just to quickly recap, recapitulate, we start off where people were really suspicious of exercise and viewed it as a sideshow. We're now a place like Equinox, their mantra, their slogan as of 2004, as you write, is it's not fitness, it's life. Or what, what is that what they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just brought it back, actually. It wasn't even their slogan for a little while, but it's like back in the news now. Right. We're back on the billboards. Right, which is, which you know, it's taking, it might be a bit of an extreme take, unless, of course, they have eucalyptus scented towels and all of their patrons were koala bears who lived off of the towels. <laughs> I wonder how do you, you know, but you, you talked about in the 2010s that there is this widening gap. People in the higher income brackets exercise more. People in lower income brackets have, have begun to exercise less. What, um, like you are someone who is, you're a fitness expert, both historically and personally. I wonder for you, what is your ideal, and I, I know this is a hard thing. I don't like to put historians on the spot too much, but I think you, I know you can. Like, what is your ideal vision for the next iteration of fitness, given all of the the limitations that we've seen go along with the, with this history in the past. Absolutely. So my vision is a world in which people have the opportunity to exercise on their own terms, mm -hmm. right? And I say that importantly because there is some, I think, misguided golden age thinking that looks back to like Kennedy and it's like, oh, if we only had the Kennedy physical fitness program. Okay. And I'm like, that program was like just basically militaristic ideology and actually alienated a lot of people from exercise. So I don't think imposing something like that on people is the answer. I think think that people, like I said, having more opportunities to, um, you know, exercise freely is really, really important. And, um, uh, okay, so and so, how does that happen? Well, I think that something that's really important actually is to kind of look out from the narrow world of the gym and instead to look at all of the things in people's lives which actually create barriers to equality of many sorts, but also um, exercise inequality. Mm -hmm. So one thing is safe and well lit streets. I mean, you cannot go out for a run if you are scared the cops are going to chase you or you're going to run into trouble in some other way. Um, if you feel like you're going to be in the dark, um, good mm -hmm. tree cover. I mean, this is something that running activist Allison Desir talks about where in lower income communities, actually the temperature is much higher because there right. isn't enough tree cover, right. right? Public recreation centers like pools, basketball courts, all of that. That kind of stuff. Um, I think that's super important. Um, and then also recall that the number one place that American kids first encounter exercise is physical education. We have so devalued that as part of it, our educational system, that as I write in the book, a lot of people who would be kick-ass PE teachers for very understandable reasons are like, no way, I'm yeah. going to go be an influencer or build a training <laughs> business. Like, right. I mean, it's, I, it's so understandable to me why people make that choice. And it's not just money. It's about a certain kind of dynamism and social respect, right? So I think all of that is really important in kind of turning all this around. The other thing that I'll say too is like, Right now, we have no expansive policy vision at all mm. for bringing together the very well-resourced fitness industry with the not-so-resourced public sector. And I think that that is a really important thing to kind of think about. Um, in the pandemic, there were 
there was bipartisan legislation, which I thought was great to kind of aid the fitness industry, which I think is important. And I supported that act very vociferously. But I think at the same time, it's a missed opportunity not to frame this crisis only as one of small business owners who are legitimately struggling, right. but also all of these kids and adults, most of them low income, who are shut out of exercise opportunities. So to me, like, all of that is super important in terms of uh, in terms of a brighter future. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts on that. And as a, someone whose favorite course, his favorite subjects always have been history and physical education. It Yay! was a thrill reading your book and a thrill chatting with you. So thank you so much, Professor Petrozell. I hope to chat with you again.